Fannie Lou Hamer, um, I became interested in her. I learned about her a long, long time ago, um, back in graduate school in the 1990s. And there was always something about her that fascinated me. Um, but I, I went on to um, write my dissertation about Harriet Tubman. And, um, and then I worked on several other books after that. But Fannie Lou Hamer was always in the back of my mind. And when um, I finished, uh, I wrote a book about Rosemary Kennedy, the uh, disabled uh, Kennedy daughter. When that was done in 2015, I was thinking about the, my next project and Fannie Lou Hamer was sort of like knocking on my, my head and saying, Kate, Kate, pay attention. So I decided to look into her life and I realized that she was so much like Harriet Tubman, only a hundred years apart. Um, they both came from, you know, these incredibly difficult backgrounds, poverty, lack of education, in incredible discrimination. Of course, Tubman was enslaved, um, but there was something about the inner core of these women that wanted to fight. And also they shared this deep and profound faith that um, sustained them during their darkest hours. So Fannie Lou Hamer was born um, in the Mississippi Delta in October of 1917. And um, it was uh, an incredibly difficult life. She was the 20th child of um, Jim and Ella Townsend. And she, um, before she, when she was born, <clears throat> the four babies before her, over a five year period before she was born, in 1917, all of them had died. So Ella, when she gave birth to Fanny, um, it was like she was determined that this baby was not going to die. And Fanny Lou Hamer did not die, she survived. And um, her siblings talked about how spoiled Fanny Lou Hamer was because she got away with things that none of them were able to get away with. Um, so she all, was the joy of the family as well. and. Um, but she grew in, grew up in a, a very difficult um, environment. At the age of six, she started picking cotton with her family, and it was just so she could the little bit of cotton that she could pick were enough to bring a few pennies into the household. Um, they moved. The family moved from uh, into Sunflower County to Ruleville when she was four years old, and they started sharecropping there. Um, and her father actually started doing pretty well, and he was able to, uh, the, the prices of cotton were high, and, um, you know, he had all these children, so he, they could pick a lot of cotton. He was able to buy some farm animals um, and also buy a used truck. So they were moving their way up, and it was very exciting for the family. But a white neighbor um, was very jealous of their success poisoned all of their animals. He put um, um, poison in the food troughs and all their animals died and it set the family back, something that they never really recovered from. Um, the, they, they suffered in these uh, shacks. They didn't have heating or indoor plumbing. Uh, the winters were very cold. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer talked about in the wintertime, uh, which was like three months out of the year that the children could go to school. And of course, black schools uh, were where the black children went. The schools were segregated. Um, most schools for black children didn't go beyond the sixth grade. And she remembered that her mother used to tie rags to the bottom to their feet so that they could um, walk to school because the ground was so cold and they didn't have shoes. And she also talked about um, they would walk into the, the dung of the animals, like the cows, because it was warm to warm up their feet. I mean, this was a really difficult, difficult life. But despite these difficulties and challenges, um, they had a rich community life. And she was a gifted singer, even as a child, um, as a young, young child. She was noted for her singing and she would get up, uh, they'd put her up on a table in the local church community room um, after uh, services 
and she would sing for everybody. She was a bright, bright child, and she just was this little star from very young age. And coincidentally, she grew up in um, in Ruleville, which is about six miles from the birthplace of the Delta Blues music. So as she's growing up, she's not only uh, singing and hearing spirituals and gospel music at church, but she's hearing work songs um, in the fields and she's hearing blues um, in the fields too. And her, um, and so many people in the area uh, ran little juke joints um, in their cabins. And um, so she was infused with many different types of music and she was able to um, use her voice in very powerful ways. And so um, she was noted for her very beautiful voice. So the, in the 1920s, uh, the end of the 1920s it were, it was a difficult time for her parents and the family. Her older siblings grew up and moved on. Uh, some settled in the area and became sharecroppers. They married um, and they lived either on the same plant plantation or in other plantations nearby. Some of her siblings moved north to Chicago, to Indianapolis. Uh, one of her brothers went into the army during World War I, and then he left and traveled north too. So they were, by the end of the 1920s, Fannie Lou was really the only one home with her parents, her very elderly parents. And um, with the onslaught of the Great Depression in 1929, it coincided with um, Fannie Lou's mother uh, receiving an injury to her eye when she was breaking up the ground in the early spring of 1930 and something flew up into her eye. And because there was really no access to health care for African-Americans, particularly there in Ruleville, Mississippi, she got, <clears throat> excuse me, she got an infection and she went blind. So her parents were very, very dependent on her. Um, in 1938, her father died of heart failure, and um, she moved in with her sister, older sister and her family, and they took care of um, Ella together. She married a guy uh, named Charlie Gray in 1939, but she divorced him in 1943. Um, it doesn't look like they spent much time together in his application for filing for divorce. He said they really hadn't lived together for a long time. But she did meet uh, um, a man by the name of Perry Pap Hamer, who was a sharecropper in Ruleville as well. And he was, he ran a juke joint in his cabin. And he also um, had a better position on his plantation, the W.D. Marlowe Plantation. And he was a mechanic, so he could repair a lot of the um, equipment on the plantation. And so he had a slightly better job and a slightly better housing. And um, so they fell in love and they got married in 1944. And here's a picture of Pap. He was kind of famous for his, um, he used to cook up chitlins in the, in the backyard. And of course he made moonshine. And um, one of the relatives told me that Pap was quite a man. He was the man, that's what he kept telling me. He was the man. He was tall and handsome and, and he and Fanny um, were deeply in love. Um, she struggled with fertility and um, they adopted two girls, uh, <clears throat> Dorothy and Virgie and raised them together. Um, but she struggled um, when she moved in and worked on the Marlowe plantation with Pap, she would complain to the other sharecroppers that they weren't treated fairly. And they weren't paid enough and she wanted better conditions and better pay etc and they all thought she was crazy because she kept complaining and they thought she was going to get in trouble and of course she lived in a world there in mississippi that was incredibly violent um, <clears throat> the clan was very active white people um, exacted violence against black people constantly and there were never any consequences to that violence so um so people were worried that fanny was going to get in trouble for all her complaining. Um, she did work in the Marlowe's house as also as a housekeeper as well. And she tells some funny stories about <clears throat> um, they had they so she didn't have indoor plumbing. 
but the Marlowe's did have indoor plumbing. And in fact, they had a special bathroom for their dog. And she resented that so much. She thought it was so ridiculous. So when she would clean for the Marlowe's and they weren't home, she would take a bath in their bathtub and she would try on Mrs. Marlowe's clothes and she'd use Mrs. Marlowe's perfume. She just loved doing that. And she also would, they would always throw away all their magazines and newspapers and Fanny would bring them home and read them. She did have a, um, a sixth grade education. Uh, when she was 13, she had to leave school to pick full time with her parents. And so um, she was a voracious reader and she wanted to keep up on things. So um, she was you know, always trying to find ways to, to do more. Um, so they were living their lives, raising these two young children. And um, the civil rights movement is beginning to percolate seriously after World War II and the soldiers coming home and the reaction to them coming back into these Southern communities. There was a lot of violence against black soldiers. Here they had been around the world fighting for freedom and equality around the world and they came home and, and they couldn't experience it uh, where they were living here in the United States. So um, in, as many of you know, in 1954, the, the court case Brown v. Board of Education it was decided that overturned Plessy versus Ferguson that um, you know, created uh, segregated schools and facilities throughout the South. But this was overturned in 1954. And you can imagine that the response of white people, many white people in the South to this um, uh, decision, and, and it sparked a lot of violence uh, against black communities and people trying to, to find equality, go into restaurants and sit with, um, you know, in desegregated places. And um, so we have in 1955, Emmett Till, who was murdered in Mississippi, about six miles from where Fannie Lou and Pap lived. So he was murdered by um, Klan members in, uh, December, in August of 1955. And then in December of 1955, Rosa Parks chose that particular day to refuse to give up her seat on the bus. And that sparked the Montgomery bus boycott um, that lasted a year. And it um, was the, the, the moment where a young minister, Martin Luther King, rose up on the scene and became this amazing figurehead and activist for the civil rights movement. Um, and then, you know, 1957, we have Little Rock where uh, the National Guard was called in or Eisenhower sent in the National Guard to protect black children who were seeking to uh, desegregate the schools there. And um, it's interesting because Fannie Lou Hamer kept claiming later in life that she had no idea that there was a civil rights movement um, it, going on around her in the 1950s. And I find that really hard to believe, knowing that she read newspapers as much as possible. Um, they did not have a television. Uh, they may have had a radio that isn't really clear, but she read a lot. And, and so I, I, I don't know why she said she had no idea that there was um, a civil rights movement going on. In fact, she did participate um, in Mississippi. There was a, um, a, a minister and a doctor by the name of T.M. Howard and he lived and he had his businesses and um, large properties in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. And um, he used to have these big festivals in May called Mount Bayou Days. And they'd barbecue chicken and they'd have uh, singers and performers come. Um, uh, and so she would go, she would help cook chickens for the barbecue. Um, and uh, but they did have secret civil rights meetings during the Mount Bayou days. They sort of used that as a facade to, for some people to meet. And Fannie Lou Hamer did go to those meetings during the 1950s, as I discovered in my research. Um, but so 57, there's Little Rock. And then um, in 1960, oh, and then 1960, as I mentioned tonight, the Greensboro um, lunch counter sit-ins where they were, the young people were attacked by you know, white supremacists that came in and threw coffee on them and mustard and ketchup and beat them up. 
And um, this started getting the world noticing the resistance that was going on in the South to desegregation. In um, 1961, uh, the Freedom Ride started, and here's a picture of one of the Freedom Riders buses uh, that was bombed in the South when it was going through. And there, of course, is jo young John Lewis uh, with Jim's work. Um, they were beaten badly in Alabama when they tried to try drive through Alabama on a desegregated bus. Um, <clears throat> this was in response to a decision that had been made in, in, in the 1940s that interstate uh, travel had to be desegregated, but it was not enforced in the South. And another court decision came down in 1960 that reaffirmed that interstate buses uh, had to be integrated and so did the bus stops with the restaurants, et cetera. But the South remained um, resistant to that. And so I'd like to you know, remind everybody of John Lewis. He was such an amazing activist and he, so many people followed him. And um, he, his, one of his famous words and speeches is that, quote, the legacy of one of being willing to not be afraid to be of good courage, to be willing to go into places where others dare to go, being willing to stand up, to speak up, to speak out and find a way to get in the way. And he did that, a young 20 year old, he put his life at risk. And some freedom riders were murdered. It was, uh, it was horrific what was going on there. Um, so uh, this is all happening around Fannie Lou. That's why I know that she could not have not known what was happening. Um, in 1961, um, as I said before, she had a lot of fertility issues. And um, one day, Mrs. Uh, Marlowe said to Fanny, you know, um, my cousin is a doctor um, in town, and why don't you go to him and maybe he can do something to help you with your infertility issues. She had uh, fibroid tumors in her uterus. So she went to uh, Dr. Doro, Dr. Charles Doro, and um, he said he could take care of it. But what he actually did was sterilize her and he did not tell her. He did it without her permission and he didn't tell her. She found out when she went home and the cook in the Marlowe house told her that she heard Mrs. Marlowe telling a friend of hers that Dr. Doro had sterilized Fanny. That sent her into a spiral of depression and anger. And um, she, whenever she confronted um, difficult times and, um, and violence, she always turned to her faith to give her strength. And this time she said she questioned her faith. Like, how could this happen? How, why, how could he do this? And she knew that she couldn't complain. She could not complain to anybody especially to the doctor and she couldn't file charges against him because he was a white man and she was a black female sharecropper. sharecropper. So she was very, uh, it was devastating to her. At the same time, her mother died as well. And so this really sent her into a spiral. She dug deep into her faith and she pulled herself out of it. And she, she was reborn in a sense. She was she had a rebirth and, a, and she said she needed to find something, a purpose. She needed to find something. She didn't know what it was, but she needed to find something as a, as a, a guiding light into the future. So um, she wasn't aware that um, Martin Luther King and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference had a woman working for King by the name of Ella Baker. She was powerful, she was amazing. And she wanted to bring young people into the movement. And King and his advisors didn't wanna bring young people into uh, the movement. They didn't wanna to have to worry about that or I, I don't know. Anyway, they didn't, but she did. So she founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC for short. And she organized young people, John Lewis and others, uh, to participate in this vision that she had of young people going into communities throughout the South and helping local black communities with whatever they needed help with. So she, when she met Bob Moses, who by the way, decided to leave a career as a math teacher in New York City 
when he saw the sit-ins and the freedom rides going on, he decided he wanted to do something too. So he met Ella Baker and he became part of SNCC. And he ended up in Mississippi with other civil rights activists. And they arrived in Ruleville and they had a meeting at the um, Williams Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. And that was Fannie Lou Hamer's church. And she heard that there was going to be a meeting, a rally of some sort there. And so she decided she wanted to go. So Pat went with her and um, they sat in the audience and um, Ella Baker and Bob Moses and several other, many other uh, civil rights activists, young, young people, early twenties, um, got up there and encouraged them to, to be more active. And they asked the community, what is it that you want us to help you with? What do you want? Of course, the SNCC folks wanted to get, help everybody register to vote. Um, in Mississippi, um, nearly half the population was black, but only 5% was allowed to vote. 5% um, had their uh, voting registrations approved. So there was no ability for people uh, of African descent, African-Americans to, to vote in Mississippi. So um, many of them didn't even bother to try to register to vote. So these SNCC workers were willing to, to help them do that. So when they asked, uh, there was like 200 people crammed into this church. And um, when they asked who would be willing to go to the courthouse, the county courthouse in nearby Indianola, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was one of 18 people that raised her hand and decided to go. And for Hamer, she said it was when she met those young people she realized they were the answer for a new path that she was looking for. She viewed them as the new kingdom on earth. She was so impressed with them. Now registration, um, reg registering to vote in Mississippi and other Southern states was very difficult. There were literacy tests and all these ridiculous things that white um, um, court officials would insist that people African-Americans in particular, would have to pass these tests before they could register to vote. Um, so Charles Doro, who was the, um, the father of Dr. Doro, um, he was the mayor of Ruleville. And when he, and there were only 2000 people that lived in Ruleville. And when he heard about these SNCC workers arriving in his village, he said, um, he said to them, I know y'all aren't from here and you're here to cause trouble. Well, I'm here to tell you to get out of town. And um, the SNCC organizers, Bob Moses and others assured him that they were just there to help people register to vote. Now, a lot of these kids, these young people came from Northern cities and towns or away from the area. They hadn't experienced what Fannie Lou Hamer and Pap and everybody else had grown up experiencing with the white power structure in these communities. And so they said, um, you know, we're here to help people to register to vote. Quote, the constitution gives us the right to do this. Well, Doro responded, well, that law ain't here yet. So he was threatening them. He had his sheriffs and his deputies with their guns, but the workers, the SNCC workers were defiant and determined. So Fannie Lou was really impressed with these young people. So she was willing to go to Indianola and take the test. And they got a, a, rented a school bus and they drove down and they got to the courthouse, they get out, they go to the door and they aren't allowed in. And the clerk of the courts tells them only uh, two at a time could go in and register to vote. This here is a picture of um, a white uh, court registrar in the neighboring Forest County. Um, his name was Theron Lind. He was famous and notorious for being really awful. He defied court order after court order to, um, to stop uh, refusing to register um, black people to vote. Uh, he hung in there till 1966 before he, they finally were able to start registering people to vote in Forest County. Um, so Fannie Lou goes in and the test is so difficult. Now she's literate and of course she flunks the test. Everybody flunks the test. So they finally, they get back on the bus and by the time they get on the bus, all these white supremacists have arrived at the courthouse 
and they're throwing water and bottles and they've got their Confederate flags and they're driving down the road and screeching their tires and harassing um, these Ruleville residents. They get back on the bus and they start driving away and soon enough they get uh, stopped by the police and the police arrest the driver on charges that he was driving a school bus the wrong color yellow. And they take him to um, jail and Bob Moses and the others who were driving in a car behind the bus went to the courthouse and bailed him out. Um, and it was Fannie Lou Hamer that calmed the people in the bus. She started singing and getting them all to calm down and sing with her while they waited for this to happen. <clears throat> so she started showing leadership pretty early on. They get back to Ruleville. She goes to her cabin out at the Marlowe Plantation. And no sooner has she walked in the door, it's dark by this time, Mr. Marlowe's banging on the door, Fannie Lou, Fannie Lou. And he's furious with her because he'd heard from the clerk at the court in Indianola that Fannie Lou Hamer had tried to register to vote. And he said to her, Fannie Lou, you go tomorrow and you take that registration back. And she said, no, Mr. Marlowe, I didn't do that for you. I went to register for me. And he said, well, if you're not gonna take your registration back, then you have to leave right now. And he kicked her out right then and there. So she went into Ruleville and she stayed with friends. She was devastated. Marlowe insisted that Pat stay, a uh, Pap stay, because it was the fall, the crop had to be brought in. And if he didn't do it, then he would owe Mr. Marlowe thousands of dollars. So he had to stay there with the kids to, so they could do, bring in the harvest. <clears throat> So it was a difficult time for Fannie Lou Hamer, very, very, very difficult time. But SNCC started, the SNCC workers started noticing that people really listened to her and paid attention to her. She was a leader and she watched and learned. And um, I talked to some civil rights veterans. I interviewed them for, my pro for this book. And one of them was a young man when he met um, uh, Hamer, Dr. Leslie Burr McLemore. And he recalled, quote, that Hamer, quote, was the star, the person that all of them were wowed by. No one equaled her storytelling. She testified, preached, led them in rousing freedom songs and was the center of attraction. Whenever Hamer got up to speak, the room hushed. She was a powerhouse, another veteran remembered. She would shine her light and people caught her spirit. There's no doubt that she was a leader. They could tell that. So they hired her. She didn't have a job anymore. And so SNCC hired her to be a field agent to recruit others to join the movement. Um, so in June of 1963, she went to South Carolina with a group of other civil rights activists from Mississippi and beyond. And they took um, a two or three week course um, on citizenship and um, taking, you know, these voting tests and helping or how to organize people, et cetera. And um, they had no tr trouble. Uh, they and they they were determined when they rode the buses that they would insist on. They would ride not ride at the back of the bus. They would sit wherever they wanted. When they stopped at different um, bus stops, they would get out and use the restrooms and the, the um, restaurants. Well, they didn't have a problem going to South Carolina, but on their way back, they were just a few miles from home and the bus driver um, had been frustrated the whole time. They could tell he was angry because they were sitting all over the bus and not sitting at the back of the bus. So he stops at um, in Winona, Mississippi um, and the you know, civil rights activists get off the bus. Several of them head to the restroom. Others wanted to go eat and they are immediately stopped. They're not allowed to sit in the restaurant. The waitresses won't wait on them. And then the restrooms, they're not allowed to go in the restrooms. They had to go in the colored restrooms. And they noticed that police started pulling into the parking lot of the restaurant. So uh, Anel Ponder, one of the young workers um, who was there, uh, she's the one on uh, your right. Um, she started taking down the, the tag numbers on the police cars. Well, the police got furious and they arrested her. 
They arrested um, the other or several others too, uh, Uvester Simpson. And, um, and and so they they arrested them, put them in cars and, and several young men as well. And Fanny Lou gets off the bus and says, what's happening? And they said, don't worry, go and get back. Um, and then, you know, just find us here in Winona. Well, the police see Fanny Lou Hamer and one of them shouts out, get her too. And they throw her in the back of a, a police car and they take them all to the Winona um, County Jail. And it was a four day torture chamber nightmare for all of them. Um, they brutally beat um, June Johnson and Danelle Ponder and, um, and several others in there. Yvester Simpson wasn't beaten, but she almost was, but she wasn't. And they beat and sexually assaulted Hamer brutally. Um, and so she was sharing a cell with Yvester Simpson and Simpson remembered that Fanny insisted that they sing the song, Walk With Me, Walk With Me, Jesus, to help keep her alive so that she would stay alive long enough to testify. So um, that gave her strength to survive the beating and the abuse um, that she endured for four days in that, um, that, that horrific jail. The jail has been torn down in the meantime um, the property is now owned by the Catholic Winona, and in 2002, local community activists asked if they could put a sign to commemorate um, this event at the Winona Jail on that property, and the church allowed it. So there's now a marker there that, that testifies to this event and this beating that Hamer and her fellow um, activists endured. And so she was. they were released on uh, June 12th. 63, just a few hours after civil rights activist Medgar Evers was assassinated in Jackson, Mississippi. But she was determined. She was not going to be intimidated. She had endured enough. And she said later, if them crackers in Winona thought they discouraged me from fighting, I guess they found out different. I'm going to stay in Mississippi. And if they shoot me down, I'll be buried there. The horror of her experience drove her for the rest of her life. And she was dedicated to fighting as fiercely as she could because she she had nothing to lose anymore. They had done practically everything they could do except kill her. And so she continued and moved on, kept fighting. So later that summer, of course, there was the, the March on Washington, Martin Luther King, the huge march that brought attention from around the world. And that was met a few weeks later in Birmingham, Alabama with the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church and the four little girls that were murdered there. The violence in the South was escalating against these activists and, and African-Americans trying to stand up for their rights and to be full citizens. Um, Hamer started working with uh, the, the uh, SNCC workers to organize black communities and form the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Since the regular Democratic Party, which was all white basically, they would not um, uh, allow people to vote. Um, so they decided to form their own party and teach people how to register to vote in mock kind of registration campaigns and also how to vote. So they'd have you know ballot boxes and things like that to show people how to vote. And so, um, they called it the freedom vote, vote for freedom in a ballot box. And this is a group of young activists, you know, encouraging people to do this and practice so that they could fight for the real ability to, to fight. SNCC also decided that they were going to organize, um, they were looking for a thousand volunteers from around the country to participate in what became known as Freedom Summer, to go down to Mississippi and to register people to vote and also to do whatever local communities needed them to do, whatever they wanted them to do. And so um, they started at the Western College for Women in Oxford, Ohio with 800 volunteers from around the country. Um, in the meantime, while this is going on in early June of 1964, um, three civil rights workers were already in Mississippi, Andrew Goodman, 
Mickey Schwerner and James Cheney, and they disappeared. And the news came to this crowd in Ohio and everyone was worried and shocked. Of course, Fannie knew what happened. They disappeared, they were dead. Um, but they were, they were not found for several weeks. Here's pictures of them, uh, Andrew Goodman on the left and uh, James Cheney in the middle. He was a local Mississippi guy and um, Mickey Schwerner on, on the right. Um, so they, these young people spread out through communities in, in Mississippi and um, they built schools, 47 freedom schools and 13 community centers. They offered K through 12 academic programming. There were many adults who could not read. So they were able to take classes. And um, Hamer later said, SNCC is the type of people that regardless of what you say, call them far left and radical and beatniks and all kinds of things. But they're still willing to go into areas with the people that's never had a chance to be treated as human beings. And some have given their lives for the cause of human justice. She said, there's more Christianity than I've ever seen in a church in those young SNCC people. So um, they stayed with black families. Those black families were harassed and um, attacked for helping and housing uh, these young workers. Um, but their goal was to get enough um, people interested in doing this and so that they could go and represent the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party at the Democratic Party uh, National Convention in Atlantic City in August of 1964. President Johnson was hoping to be nominated again to be president. And um, the all white Mississippi delegation, of course, would not allow any black delegates to go. So Fannie Lou Hamer and 68 other people went to, Missis to Atlantic City to challenge the seating of the all white Mississippi regular Democratic Party. So there was a, a, a hearing and um, Martin Luther King spoke and several other uh, activists spoke and then Fannie Lou Hamer got up and she sat down. She wore a borrowed dress, borrowed shoes, borrowed handbag because she didn't have clothing that was nice enough, she felt. She sat down and you can see this online, go look for it on YouTube or the American Experience series from PBS and you can see this, it hot, She's nervous, but she sits down. She has no notes. And according to the New York Times and other people that were there, she kept the audience spellbound. People were crying, black and white people were crying by her, because of her speech. She told the audience what had happened to her in that jail, what was happening all the time in Mississippi just because they wanted to be, um, to be able to vote. Um, she said uh, at the end, and if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Her speech threatened a carefully orchestrated convention. President Johnson worried it would damage his chances to get the Democratic nomination because of all those white Southern delegations. Well, it didn't matter because those Southern delegations were so angry, they walked out, especially the Mississippi delegation, they walked out. Most of them ended up voting for Barry Goldwater. A lot of those Southern Democrats became Republicans. Thousands of people joined them outside the convention center protesting. Here's Hamer with Mickey Schroeder's parents. Um, their crowds, the press was covering them. The Klan um, had killed and buried the bodies in an earthen dam. They were discovered just a couple of weeks before the convention. And um, so that it was still fresh on everyone's mind. Um, here is Bob Moses with Fannie Lou Hamer. She's trying, they're trying to take the seats of the white delegates. The security kept taking them out. And then other delegations would give them their passes so they could get back into the convention and sit down and then they'd be escorted out by um, security again. Um, there was negotiations going on in the back. Um, Hamer wanted to have their all their people replace the white Mississippi delegates. Um, Hubert Humphrey got involved in negotiating the deal. Eventually Martin Luther King and his group of, of advisors um, settled on two at-large seats, not real seats. 
And Hamer was furious at Martin Luther King and the rest of them for making that deal. And she felt betrayed and very, very angry. But she went home ready to fight some more. She ran for public office. She lost, but she challenged the seating of the uh, Congress people who were elected that fall and went and, and protested in Congress and demanding that she and um, her colleagues be seated in instead of those con the white Congress people that were elected that um, September, I mean that November. And eventually there was a House vote to discuss this. She was invited with her colleagues, Annie Devine and Victoria Gray, and they were allowed to sit in on the floor of the House when the vote took place. And they were the first African-Americans since uh, Reconstruction to be able to sit on the House of, in, in Washington, DC. She worked a little bit with Martin Luther King. Here she is in the uh, March Against Fear in 1966. They, I won't say they didn't get along, but they didn't really interact much. She was grassroots, always on the ground. He was a big national figure. He didn't deal with what she was dealing with daily, getting food and clothing and, and resources to the community. He, he was you know, on the national stage. Um, her daughter, Dorothy, died during this time period. She had anemia, she was pregnant and um, she died, they couldn't get her to a hospital that would provide uh, good care for her in time. They had to take her all the way to Memphis and she died just as they got there. So it was a crushing blow and another uh, example of the lack of access to resources in Ruleville and other places in Mississippi. But she kept fighting, she kept fighting and fighting. She, um, you know, she got, um, you know, a national activists to pay more attention to what was going on in Mississippi. And um, she got involved with the Democratic Party. And uh, in 1968, she was part of the convention. The convention uh, rejected the all white Mississippi delegation and uh, had Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Party come and sit on the convention floor so they could vote. She got very involved in the party and its platform, and she helped um, inform their decision to put in their platform that they wanted access to daycare, free and low cost medical clinics, food subsidy programs, support for higher education and job training programs, and so many more things. She received a standing ovation at the convention. She had become so important to everybody in, in the fight for equality and justice. In 1970, um, uh, she continued her fight. Here she is at Lafayette Square at a, a rally against um, Vietnam. Um, and so she was, she was everywhere and she was all over the country, campuses everywhere, college campuses and um, giving speeches and, and rallying people to keep fighting. Because she knew that if people relaxed, it would go back to the old ways. She was determined that everybody registered to vote. She got involved um, with some powerful African-American women too. Here's Dorothy Height um, and Polly Cohen and the, at the National Council of Negro Women. Um, she helped, uh, Dorothy Height helped raise money so that Hamer could establish a, uh, a freedom farm, a farm co-op so that they had pigs for local community members to take home and raise and slaughter and um, plant crops because a lot of uh, plantation owners they didn't want you uh, planting anything but cotton. So they needed to be able to grow food somewhere else. So the, the Freedom Farm, the farm co-op was that answer. Um, so she, you know, she just kept fighting for local causes. Um, she decided to run for, um, uh, for office in 1971. And she also worked with the Women's Political Caucus um, and she became friendly with Gloria Steinem and Bella Abzug and there's Shirley Chisholm and uh, Betty Friedan and others. Um, so she was really stepping up on the stage. And when she decided to run in 1971 for office in Mississippi, um, she was still really angry, but she had to remind herself to, she had to stay focused. And she said, I really don't hate any man. There's gotta be something wrong psychologically with a person to have me beaten because of the color of my skin. Hate is like a cancer, she said. It eats away at a human being until they become nothing but a shell. 
They, that same hate will make you stay up at night. That's the reason you have the Ku Klux Klan and all these other hate groups, that a man should stay up all night trying to figure out how he can fix a sheet to make a point in it to go out and terrorize another human being is really stupid. The point is not in the sheet, it's in his head. I just find that unbelievable. Um, she suffered from a lot of uh, physical ailments. She had diabetes, hypertension, um, and she suffered uh, kidney failure because of uh, the beating that she took. Her eye, a left eye was deeply impaired because of the beating. And, um, but access to healthcare was still an issue. It was a huge issue, but she, she soldiered on. She kept working and fighting for causes and trying to draw attention to what was going on in Mississippi. So she died in March of 1977. She had breast cancer and um, she died at the age of 59. And one civil rights, actor, actor, um, civil rights activist, uh, Tracy Sugarman said, all my memories of Fannie Lou Hamer are ones filled with frenetic movement and gigantic energy. A kinetic quality emanated from her like waves setting in motion all who were in her path. Though she was sick and, also, and often unable to work, she continued to fight through the pain and discomfort and the threats and the violence. Um, and so, she walked into that convention in 1964 alone, but she walked away with a nation that knew her and began to support her and activate to make things better, to make a better, to make the world a better place. And she was an ordinary woman who did extraordinary things. And that's why I find her to be an extraordinary, extraordinary human being that every American should know about. Thank you.